Good morning. My name is Christine Van Leeuwen, and I'm a National Product Manager with Graybar. I would like to welcome you to Graybar's G2 Talk presentation, Game Changers, Understanding Energy Codes and the Impact on Your Business. This talk is part of a webinar series we offer each month for our customers. We have a great discussion lined up for you today, but before I get started, I would like to cover a few housekeeping items. First of all, if you were one of the first 50 people who joined in on this presentation, you will receive a coupon for a free cup of coffee courtesy of Graybar as a thank you for your time today. Also, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a box for Q&A. Feel free to submit questions throughout the presentation. We'll address as many questions as time permits at the end of the presentation. Lastly, our G2 Talks are all archived on the graybar.com website, so you'll be able to view this presentation again or recommend it to others. Today, we're happy to team up with Lutron, a full-service distributor. As a full-service distributor and energy product specialist, Graybar works alongside Lutron to provide the latest lighting control technology to help provide significant energy savings and ease of installation. Lutron offers the largest breadth and depth of products across all categories of controls. They continue to lead the industry in development, technology, and digital platforms. You can visit graybar.com to learn more about our solutions. Why now? The controls market is experiencing tremendous growth. Plus, stricter energy co efficiency codes, the need for energy savings, the increasing demand for multi-level lighting control, and the increasing interest from building owners to obtain LEED certification or driving greater adoption. Let me introduce you to Gerard Darville, Director of Product Management of Lutron Electronics. Gerard is a registered professional engineer and certified energy manager, currently responsible for electrical distribution and electrical contractor programs at Lutron Electronics. He joined Lutron as a project engineer in 1997 after graduating with honors from Lehigh University. Gerard's numerous roles have included <clears throat> Director, Energy Business Unit, European Engineering and Operations Leader, Commercial AV Sales Leader, and numerous sales and engineering assignments. Gerard has spoken at regional and national audio audiovisual, electrical contracting, government, and energy conferences. I'll hand over the presentation to Gerard, who will review today's agenda topics. Thank you, Christine, and thanks for inviting me to present to your audience and our customers. I'm excited to present on the energy codes topic because I think it's really timely, like Christine said. And if you do it correctly, there's a huge opportunity and huge profit for contractors out there. So today, we're going to go through how lighting energy codes affect contractors, what's changing, what basic you need to know to be successful, how it affects your business, what are some of the costs associated with non-compliance? How does it affect basically retrofit new construction? But most importantly, we're going to talk about a process for success. We're going to step you through it and how to be successful in this new world of energy codes in your business. And at the end, we will show a couple solutions and resources that you can actually reference after this presentation. On the right, you will see the process for success. We'll go through energy codes. We'll talk about sequence of operations, installation, and then service. You will see this pop up throughout the presentation. But first, let's talk about energy codes. When I say code, most contractors just think I'm talking about the NEC code, and that's the only code that they kind of focus on, rightfully so. They focus on NEC code and NFPA 70 and 70E. Let's take a look at where that came from. Why do building codes exist? Before the NEC code, there were no building or electrical codes that existing. And then, of course, you, you probably remember, or at least heard the story about the Great Chicago Fire in 1871. That was the sort of key thing that led to the creation of building codes and electrical codes. And since then, we have the NEC code that forms the basis of what local, most local jurisdictions use or enforce. Of course, we all know that local jurisdictions follow the NEC code and add additional requirements as needed. The results have been safer buildings. The electrical systems have gotten more complicated. 
But, the, but because of the code and because of training contractors like yourselves, our buildings have gotten safer and safer. Now let's take a look at the past before energy codes. We all remember or heard about the great oil crisis in 1973. It got to a point where in November 8, 1973, President Nixon actually ordered lights around D.C. and special monuments to actually be dimmed or turned off. Out of that, we started creating energy codes, and ASHRAE was formed, which is the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers. They got together and created the first basic energy code, which is referred to as 90.1. But today there are many energy codes that actually play in this arena. We like to reference in the industry the big three, which is ASHRAE 90.1, IECC, or the International Energy Conservation Code, and of course California with their Title 24 Part 6. So those are the big three. Today, every state or most states have adopted an energy code based on ASHRAE, or IECC. Some may not have a statewide code, but their local municipalities have a code that has, has, is as strict or stricter than the basic code of the day. What's leading to this? More, if I had shown you this state map years ago, very few would have actually had a code in place. Because of the cost of actually building power plants, the need to actually save energy, federal mandates, more and more states are starting to take this seriously, and the Department of Energy asked all states by November 2013 to actually have a version of the code in place, a plan to have a version of code in place that is strict as ASHRAE 90.1 2010. So what results have this had? Why do we care? Why, why, why do we continue to do this? Because it actually had results. If you take a look at the energy use index of buildings based on the 1980 code, and based on the latest version of the code, the building designed for that would consume 50% less energy, which is a big deal for us. It has actually helped us slow the construction of new power plants and infrastructure. And it actually created a whole new industry of energy efficiency for all of us. So let's start with the process of success. So codes exist. They're starting to be enforced. They're starting to be different in states. But how do I be successful? Actually, it starts with just understanding the local code that affects your state or jurisdiction. Understand how it has changed and continues to change. It's very important not just to learn one time, but to keep understanding what is going on. And then understand some basic terms and requirements and what it means for you as a contractor. So let's take a look at how energy code has evolved. In the 1980s, think about right after the 1970s when this was the oil crisis happened and it started, they focused mainly on lighting power density. Let's just get the average watts per square foot down, and let's do some basic manual control. Believe it or not, before the 1970s, 1980s, a basic on-off switch wasn't required in most spaces. The energy code drove that adoption. Very quickly, we move forward in the 80s, take a look at the lighting power density requirements drop significantly, and then you start seeing automatic shutoff start happening. That's when you started seeing time clocks and time clocks and time clocks. Now in 2015, 2016, today, the lighting power density has gone down significantly. And take a look at all of the control schemes that are required. And we'll go through a couple of these. The one big change, a couple big changes has happened is that light reduction control or dimming or bi-level switching is required. And now time clocks are okay, but occupancy centers are now required in more and more spaces. So we'll talk about understanding those as a big need for making this successful. So let's take a look at the past. I can call it sort of the good old days. We'd be able to walk into a room, flip a toggle switch, the lights will come on, and we can actually all understand this very quickly. Everybody understood what happened, and we didn't even actually even train most people about lighting. We kind of could teach our contractors on the, on the fly. But if you take a look at that space today, <clears throat> let's take a look at how it has changed. First of all, if you take a look at lighting power density, before it used to be mostly fluorescent, even halogen back in the day, now it's mostly LED. And we'll talk about how that 
you know, LED, 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 it's here. Manual controls. Now you see wireless and wired controls. It used to be time clocks, now it's arc sensors. Lots and lots of occupancy sensors. We take a look, take a look at coordination. Dimming, bi-level control, daylighting control, and even receptacle controls are coming up. So that room is wired differently, programmed differently, and requires significantly differences in, in technology knowledge and actually installation practices. So before you keep moving forward, I want to re keep thinking about making sure you're familiar with the local ju jurisdiction. What, that could be a state or a city. For instance, we have many contractors who cross borders in different states. The requirements vary by state. So you want to understand, if you do business in multiple states, understand the differences. One state may be using ASHRAE 90.1-2010. The next state may be using IECC 2012. But understanding the basis of what I'll explain today will get you at least to the level where you will understand the differences between those codes or state codes a little bit more easily. But it's very important to understand that. So let's take a deeper look at the energy codes and why it really matters <clears throat> to understand wh what it means by space type. We like to teach the energy codes by space type rather than the entire building because we can explain it a little bit easier in room by room status. So at Lutron, we have created basic, uh, almost a cheat sheet, and it's available. You see the, the app guide uh, linkage here. But if you go through this, there are a couple things that you notice. The actual way the room works changes by what type of room you're in. So for instance, a classroom has a local switch, but isn't allowed to have a time clock. Open office, you have a local switch, and you can either use a time clock or an occupancy sensor. As a former contractor myself, I don't like ORs a choice. I want somebody to make a choice. So it's very important to understand what the choices are and make sure they get made quickly on on the project. But it's also a good model to understand, okay, guys, by this room, this is how this works. This room, this is what is needed. We have these created for all different space types in the building. So once you understand the energy code that's required in your state, understand how it affects the room types or space types on your project. Where to find more information about this? Because I can, we don't have enough time today to explain the actual different space types and different code requirements in each. You can go to lutron.com energy codes. You can go to energycodes.gov, explains this a little bit. One of the great tools that we have at Lutron and available to everybody is our app guides. But also, one of the key resources that I've found most contractors use very successfully is manufacturers reps, your local gray bar team. And also, what's starting to happen is actually your local contractor training association is starting to train people on these codes and how it affects the contract. It's actually starting to train people about occupancy sensors and how it affects the actual installation. Now, going beyond codes, so the basic energy code that, that gets into your building is basically the basic requirement to get, in some states, the CO basically make, meet the state requirements. Lots of clients are going above and beyond that. They use the energy code as a basis, but Standards are green standards, like LEED and green globes go beyond that. So you may be on a project that has, that's trying to get LEED gold or LEED platinum. Once you're on those, you, the energy code is just a prerequisite. You're going to do that anyway, but they may want you to go beyond. They may want you to put dimming everywhere. They may want you to put demand responses beyond this. So I'm not going to cover that in great detail today, but you can find information at usgbc.org or contact your Lutron Gray Bar Rep to learn more about this. So now, the most critical part of this talk that I kind of want to reiterate the contractors, and as I go around the country, this is the one thing I preach over and over again, and the contractors who use this successfully has the most successful and profitable projects. And that is, once you understand the code, once you understand what's required in the space type, you need to create a sequence of operations for those space types that you communicate throughout your project. So for instance, you can say, okay, the arc sensors will come on to fall in the space type, and we'll program that, but we'll walk people through the space. What it does is it creates the basis of design, it creates and limits your scope of work for the project, and then it is a great story, which I'll show you later, to tell the end user to make sure you've actually communicated and installed it correctly to the code and beyond. 
let's, let's dig into this a little bit deeper. But before we do, I want to explain some of those terms that you heard earlier. When you take a look at energy code language online or even when you go to some training sessions, the code literally says things like light reduction control. What that really means basically is either you're going to have to put a bi-level switch or, bi or dimmer to reduce the lighting by more than 50%. So basically when you see light reduction control, that code would either have bi-level or dimming. In California, mostly dimming and other codes, it depends on what space you're in. Daylight responsive control, wow, that's a big term, but basically it means if you have windows or skylights, you will need to control the lights near to them with that daylight sensor mostly via DIMI. Not a terminology, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time here because <clears throat> as you saw earlier, as the codes move forward throughout the years, it started with time clocks. But now a lot of spaces that time clocks were acceptable are no longer the case. More and more spaces by code are requiring occupancy sensors. Now in the in the actual code, they don't necessarily say occupancy sensors, they say automatic shutoff, and they talk about modes of operation for this automatic shutoff. So let's just go through a few, and of course this presentation will be available for you to reference later. But this is really important because this affects how the user interacts with the, the, the project, and it affects whether you call back to the job to fix a problem is not a problem. So for instance, one of the modes is manual on. That is, that sensor, when you walk into the room, the only way to turn those lights on is physically pressing a button. The, man, the person, the human being, manually does something. However, when you leave the room, the lights turn off. You can physically turn off or it can be automatically turned off by the sensor. Auto on, which is basically the occupancy that we knew about in the past. You walk into the space, the lights turn on automatically. You leave, you, know, you get lazy, forget to turn them off. It turns off automatically. Recently, and this has been recent in the past two code cycles, you start hearing about partial on or partial off. Partial on is required in most of the codes as they move forward. And what this means really is that when you walk into the space, some of the lights turn on. Typically, about half of the lights will turn on. There are two ways to do that. You, t you get two circuits in the room or two zones and you turn one of them on. The other way to do it is just put a dimmer in and program it that it comes to 50%. Then partial off, is what we're seeing used in those sort of semi-critical spaces like stairwells, where the lights will turn the, the sensor will turn the lights on, but they will never turn the lights off. So in stairwells, this has helped actually get people used to having oxygen sensors in stairwells. You walk into the space, there's some light, and when you walk in the space, it actually goes up to full. When you leave, it never goes off. That's 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 the four modes of operation. The reason why I want you to spend some time understanding this is because when you create a sequence of operations. And if it gets programming correctly, or if you program a classroom, for instance, classroom A, the manual on, classroom B, somebody made a mistake and did it as auto on, you're going to confuse the tenants, and you're going to get a phone call back for something that could be perfectly innocent that costs you money. Functional testing is also a new trend that is coming and is not going away. It's required in a lot of the codes. And what this means is that you or somebody uh, has to verify that the sensors and the lighting control actually works and is programmed as, as stated. So let's review the sequence operations again. What is it? It's basically a story, a narrative, something that explains how each of the spaces will work, that you can use to clearly communicate the intent of what you want the space to do or what end user wants the space to do. What I tend to do before I tell the contractor to start a project, make sure this is defined. The reason is because it limits the scope of what I'm going to do in that project. Also, if the sequence of operations calls for something initially and it gets changed, it can not only just change my scope, it can change it drastically. For instance, if it went from just basically on and off control to dimming control, it's very important that you do this and define it. Now the Interesting thing that, that, that happens in the industry is we, we assume sometimes that, well, who does this? Who decides this sequence of operation? And some people say, well, it should be the specifier or the engineer. You're correct. It should be, maybe. But you guys all know that a lot of specifiers do not create sequence of operations or don't do it well enough or just totally pass it on to us or pass it on to you guys, the contractor. 
So if it's not defined, I advise all the contractors to spend a couple minutes or a day even to define it. And then I get that signed off before I move forward. Because that sort of explains what I'm, what I'm on the hook for. So please create it based on the code and communicate it to everybody, not just your project manager, everybody on your team. <clears throat> I'm going to go through a couple examples. So here's, here's the conference room. You have a refractive ceiling plan. You probably show some wiring. But right next to it or somewhere, somebody should create a basic sequence of operations. This one comes from something that Lutron creates on the fly automatically for you. But you can actually create this yourself. So let's walk through this. So when an occupant enters, or me or you, enters the space, the lights will not automatically turn on. They will need to turn the lights on manually. What that defines is that you will have an occupancy sensor in that room set the manual on mode. That's basically what that means. But then the user doesn't necessarily need to know that. The user just needs to know this is how the space will work. When occupied, so when I'm in the room, when in the space, so if I'm walking through an end user or owner's rep through this, I say, but when you walk into this room, you know, the overhead lights will dim and brighten as the daylight gets brighter outside. What that really means to you is that there's a daylight sensor and there's some dimming LED fixture, or dimming ballast in there. Also, when you're in the room, you can actually physically dim or turn the lights on and off. What that means is that somebody has to install a manual control or a remote or something to turn the lights on and off. That's what that means. They don't even know what it is, but they'll know that it's in the space. And that way, as your team actually starts installing this, they go, oh, wow, this room's supposed to automatically turn off. Where's my sensor? We missed it, right? It's supposed to be a switch here. And of course, when the occupant leaves, or when I leave or you leave the room, the lights will turn off after 30 minutes. Now, <clears throat> it's very important because the code typically says up to 30 minutes. It's, I like to define the timeout because if the customer changes their mind and they say I need it to be 15 minutes or 5 minutes, I have it documented that we both agree that it's 30 and my scope of work has changed. And this happens a lot. So make sure you, you, you set it, define it, and reiterate it to the customer. So that's normal language that then in turn leads to product and in turn leads to some programming. It, that's an example of a conference room. We can go the same thing through a private office, right? Very basic. Uh, in, in this case, you know, it's, it's almost identical. But sometimes in small private offices, if there's no daylighting, there will be no sensor. So you need to clearly communicate that we will not put one. It's not needed. And, and here's, here's the private office showing the wiring and the sequence of operations together. So you, you communicate both, and you will have a successful project. So again, I want to reiterate the importance of the sequence of operation. It eliminates confusion on the design intent between the teams. Create the story. The wonderful thing about getting the sequence of operation signed off is even some of the product could change along the way, but at least you don't have to go back to the owner owner's rep. The team understands what we're doing. Here's why we designed it. Pass it on the installation team. Here's what we're actually installing. Pass it on the turnover team. Anything changes, Note, 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 change the scope, communicate, communicate. Again, like I said, it clearly defines what you're doing as a contractor, what you're turning over to the end user. And that way, at the end of the project, you deliver it, they're happy, you can explain what you did, you can actually teach them how the space gets used. Again, I can't reiterate this as contractors, but it helps define your scope of work. It really does. It actually gets you off these projects sooner and more profitably. One of the key things that I've actually seen and contractors have told me that this does is it eliminates all those callbacks after the project is over. What happens a lot is we're all getting used to this new world order of how controls are playing a part in our lives. A lot of people are used to walking into an office, the lights are already on for them because the, 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 the time clock has turned the lights on, and they leave. Nothing happens, right? They have a switch, maybe. Now we're installing these systems where in some rooms, the lights will turn on automatically. Other rooms, they will need to press a button to turn them on and off. You can see how that could lead to some confusion where you can get a phone call. I've actually had stories of contractors getting a service call to come out to fix a problem that the customer thought was the contractor's problem. They roll a truck out there only to find out that it's programmed exactly how they intended it to be programmed. So who builds what there? It's because the construction team, the contractor, didn't communicate Everybody had the rooms with the work and didn't educate the customer at the end. 
if that was done, I'm sure the, co the contractor could said, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, the space works as properly intended. If you would like us to come out there and change it to a different method, our guys are more than willing to do so, and we know how to do that. And again, that's, what, that's where I kind of introduced that it leads you as a position as a code expert for future business. So the sequence of operations is created. Now what's next? Now let's move on to the installation portion of this. And this has actually changed significantly for contractors out there as well. You've got to get trained on the lighting light control products. At least get trained, make sure your contractors are comfortable with occupancy sensors, comfortable with daylight sensors, kind of where to place them. Because I know that, yes, it's on a drawing, right? But if they kind of know from experience that this is where it goes, then that actually helps, right? The drawing could be wrong. But based on their experience of training, they know, hey, something's up here. Um, get them to understand the benefits and how to use wireless controls, which is a trend, or low voltage controls, which is also something that's actually out there that's actually growing fast. And then make sure that they are practically almost confirming the installation or functionally testing as they go. Right? You can do some of these things as you install it. Yep, it works correctly. Yes, I can move on. So let's re revisit, again, the past we talked about it. It was very basic. I talked to a lot of contractors who said, man, we taught this stuff on the job, right? Yes, we could send them to a little school to say, here's a high voltage switch, you know, don't, don't make sure you do it safely. But most of the lighting stuff, full, hot, neutral, and ground to it, turn it on and off. It's quite easy. I'm not saying easy, but it's quite easy to understand. And now let's revisit that same space. Multiple controls, multiple sensors. Now, you can take a look at this. It's confusing some people. And what some contractors are doing is training somebody in lighting controls with an installation standpoint and having sort of like a mini expert, but making sure everybody's familiar with it. What's, what's happening here is now I have to control the receptacles. How do I do that in, in some of the codes? I need to control lighting differently. I need multiple zooms. Having somebody to understand this makes the project move faster. You see now that... Uh, a lot of wireless happening, and contract is starting to stage a little bit more. But understand what's required. Make sure you have somebody who understands this from an installation standpoint as well. Then once it's installed, you've got to start thinking about confirming the installation, functionally testing it. In the codes, it talks about functionally testing. All of the codes, the latest versions of them, have a reference to them. Some of them actually enforce it. And again, this goes back to Yes, we started designing controls, and yes, we probably installed them, but some people just never programmed them, never commissioned them, never actually made them work. And the utilities in the states are starting to say, okay, we need energy savings. We need people to be comfortable with this. Make sure they actually work. So the functional testing really is just confirming what's going on. How are states enforcing this? So one of the re ways actually states start to enforce the actual energy codes is actually to implement functional testing and actually get people to sign off on the installation. It's not in all the states, but one of the leading ones is California. Um, they have a California lighting control uh, teaching program <clears throat> that have acceptance testers trained to do this. So you install the product, you sort of test it yourself, and then a, an acceptance tester comes out and checks it for you. And then you can get your CEO. It could be somebody that you, that you actually, as a contractor, be trained to, be, to, to actually get certified to do it. Or you could hire a third party. But even with states with no enforcement, we see the best contractors either having their team go through a checklist themselves or have a, another member of their team go through because they see that it eases the transition to the owner. Now let's take a look at this Cal... Uh, CTP program because I think it's a model that's moving forward and I actually just flew, uh, just got back from California where they're actually taking this uh, national in a lot of states as well. So it was a statewide initiative. They increased the use of controls in commercial buildings, but they found they need to educate the train and train that contractors and state certified electricians in general to how to do this. They felt they needed to train people and then they need to train people on how to do it, how to install it, but also how to test it and approve it. Out of that came trained technicians and acceptance testers who actually test the functional testing, test it, and sign off on it. 
we've seen that people are starting to actually take it up in other states. You'll see the same Cal CTP program, and instead of the C, it's now an N for national. So they, they're, they're, they're taking this national in, in several states and Canada. So once you've actually installed it to the sequence of operations and actually tested it, got it functionally tested and approved, we really need to figure out how to turn this project over and lighting controls, because lighting is everywhere and controls every net space, becomes a good catalyst to actually make sure that project is turned over adequately and correctly. So we'll talk about how to transfer it, how to communicate the system capabilities, train in the facility manager with walkthroughs, and then set yourself up for possibly do retro commissioning. So when you transfer the space to the owner, hopefully you have walked the owner, or owner's rep, or somebody at that facility who's going to work on this facility early on in the process. Either virtually, you bring them into your trailer, you bring them to your office, you go through the plants and say, hey, in the bathrooms, this is what's going to happen. You walk them through a sequence of operations virtually. So this is not going to be new to them when you take them in the building. Hey, Mr. Casey, you know, your project is ready to be turned over. Let me walk you through a couple of typical spaces. When you open this door and walk in this room, like we discussed earlier, you can see how the lights turn on automatically. Here's the control. Here's how it works. If you need some further training, we're available for you for a fee. Again, I'm a, I'm a, I, we all need to make money out of this and be profitable, but by setting it up, they understand what is capable and what is possible. During this walkthrough, sometimes we also talk about, and I hate to say this, but we sell ourselves. The contractors sell their services, right? And they say, okay, we've finished this couple of work. We understand that these controls can do more than what we programmed in our original scope of work. If you would like to expand this in the future, tie into a billing network, add shading controls, add demand response, add some more control points. Our staff at you know, GC Electric is more than capable of doing this. Please give us a call. We're very familiar with this. Some contractors take the opposite view. They just turn it over and hope their person never calls them because they don't want to touch the controls. Those who touch the controls get sequence operations, get more business in the future. Also, what happens with these controls, and we set this expectation up front, is that as you move into the space and change furniture around and, and change walls and move stuff and paint things, we know that potentially six months later or a few months later, you probably would want us to come out as an expert and fine-tune your controls for you this year and next year, right? And again, that could be a new scope of work, but you're setting it up nicely for the end user as an expert. You can upgrade buildings and upgrade the controls in a new building. If you sorry, an adjacent building. Typically, what we've seen is a lot of campuses. You do the new building, right? You walk the owner through, and at the same time, you say, "Well, I noticed that building over there, you know, could possibly use some of these controls. If you're interested, my team is more than willing and capable of doing that." Or the end user moves in a new building and says, "This is awesome, right? I love this stuff. I love being able to dim my lights and the daylighting. I love the energy savings." Who do I call to make sure I get a building over there? Hopefully, you've set yourself up for that. The other thing that we've heard from end users and contractors is facility staff turns over pretty quickly. Today, facility manager takes care of this building. He moves to a new campus. The person you've trained to do this has moved on, and then you now start getting phone calls. Set yourself up as a person who they could call on to help come back in for a fee to help train the next facility guy. Right? It, this, this control system I've installed is pretty easy to understand. However, if you, if you uh, change staff or change things, our guys are more than willing to come in for a day's service to help you, help you understand it and program some, some, some fine-tuning the controls at the same time. And, of course, don't be afraid to, and I know some of you already offer service contracts, but offer this as part of the controls. We'll come back in to do some fine-tuning once every year, once every two years, once every six months. It's part of our fee. Would you like to, us to consider that? And all this is set up for you to be successful. Follow the process, and controls are now so prevalent that these questions are going to pop up. Seize the opportunity. Set yourself up for success. So sort of continue wrapping this up, <clears throat> I want to go through the process again very, very quickly, but sort of remind us of the process. Number one, get to know your energy codes. 
Learn the requirements. Get the cheat sheets of, of a gray bar of a Lutron. Get some basic understandings of the leading three. If you're not in California, the two, the two main codes, and what version of it. I forgot to mention that, and I think I did mention a bit briefly on the map, some states may be on ASHRAE 2010, some may be on 2007. Hopefully all of them will be moving to 2013 soon. But understand the subtle differences. Learn what's required in the states that you do business in, or the cities. Some states may not have a statewide code, like I said, but the city of Phoenix, for instance, may have a different one than, than, than another city in Arizona. Get to understand it. Create the sequence of operations. If it's not created, create it. If it's confusing or not clear, have it clarified. You don't want in the sequence of operations, these rooms will have a manual on control or a time clock. That doesn't do anything for me, for you, the contract, to anybody. That creates confusion. Sometimes the code allows that. If you see that, do an RFI and say, please clarify the statement. I cannot explain this to the end user, and it doesn't do anything for my budget or for the scope of work. If it's not created, create it. It sets you up for success, it limits the scope, and then creates you, make it easier to transition the project later. I want to keep stressing that because it is the key to this entire process. Install. And with installation of controls, like I said, the key thing is to make sure people are trained and comfortable. Some people may not have installed lock sensors and daylight sensors and low voltage and wireless controls yet. They're going to have to do it. They will do it. Get them comfortable with it. And then with these new technologies, wireless, in fixture controls, you may want to think differently about your process. You may have they do some more prefab work. You may want the distributor to do some pre-kitten for you to help with this whole help with this whole process. And then let's spend a lot of time on the service, which I just re went through, but I want to spend some time here. Don't be afraid of it. You've got the secrets of operation to help you install it correctly. Use that to walk through the space and sort of get out of this, get out of the building sooner. One of the things a lot of contractors struggle with is getting off the project in a timely and profitable fashion. We find a sequence of operations for anything, not just controls, but especially controls, helps you get off that project and then limit the scope. During that one year or two years, or whenever you have to create some a warranty of service, it helps, let's say, that's outside of my scope. Remember we talked about it, Mr. Casey, end user, we've done that. This is outside of the scope. We'll be more than willing to come out and make those adjustments for you. Set yourself up for the other buildings. Set yourself up for the expansion. Don't be afraid of it. Again, same thing with the service. Provide different sort of services. Set yourself up for retro commissioning. And then create follow-up in that. Have all of your technicians or contractors who are trained in this, when they go on a service call, keep them looking for opportunities. If they say, they hear things like, man, we love these controls over here, don't be afraid to say we can, you know, remember we told you we can actually expand this in other buildings pretty easily. Follow the process, be successful, win more business. So what do I do after this? Number one, this is the starting of your training. You may even know some of this stuff. Some of the the process. Review the process. Prove out the process on all prove out the process on upcoming project and contact your local gray bar sales rep to help you through this process and help you educate you further. Thank you, Gerard. That was an excellent presentation. At this time we'd like to address some questions that have been submitted. As a reminder, you can submit a question using the QA box at the bottom of your screen. If we don't get to your question, a Graybar representative will follow up with you after the presentation. So Gerard, the first question we got is, how can I avoid callbacks? Great question. And I'm glad that was asked because it's one of the key things that's happening with these controls. It, it could be confuse, confusing the people how the space operates. The most important thing, Christine, is as a contractor, I know you may not think it's a responsibility, but create that sequence of operations. Write it down in a neat narrative, communicate it throughout the process, and most importantly, during that turnover, 
walked the space and said, remember, we, we decided the program it this way, it's programmed this way, and it works this way. At that checkoff, then if the callbacks happen, it's going to be because of something probably failed rather than you getting the confused in the message, but this space doesn't operate the way I want it to. But it's a great question. It's a key thing to make sure we're profitable. A lot of, a lot of controls go into these buildings, and people can be confused by how they operate. Clarify that, and your callbacks will be less, or your callbacks will be, hey, help me expand this. Help me change it, and you can get paid for it. Great question. Thank you. The second one was, <clears throat> how do I keep up to date with my local changes? Well, that, that, that's great. That's a good question because it changes uh, sometimes yearly, sometimes every three years. The best way to do it, honestly, is to contact your local code expert, which could be your Graybar uh, team member. I know Graybar is committed to actually getting trained and experts there. Uh, if not, uh, your, your favorite, uh, I'm not a plug for Lutron, but the Lutron guy. Um, but if you don't, if that doesn't work for you, Start with energycodes.gov website. At least it'll tell you what the code is today. That's a good way to stay up to date. I use it sometimes to keep up to date as well because states are continually changing. But start with your local expert. Hopefully, is your local gray bar sales rep. I know they're committed to training. If not, double check yourself at energycodes.gov or lutron.com forward slash energy. Great. Thank you. And. Um Another question we have is, where can I find out more about lead building codes? Uh, that's a good question. Um, there's, there's several places. Uh, I would start with the usgbc.org website. However, Lutron also has some information, w.lutron.com forward slash lead. Um, also, uh, if you want, and people, Christian, if people are really interested in that, uh, we and other manufacturers have some great presentations we, we, we present at our local distributors, uh, you can actually put that on. But again, if you want an independent site, it's usgbc.org. It's a good place to start. Great. Um, and good. Uh, and there was actually a follow-up question to that one. Um, he says, uh, I've heard about lead gold or lead green. Can you explain the difference? Oh, that's, boy, it's, Christian, that's also not another great question because I think it, 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 it shows some of the confusion that's happening out there. Um, those are two different things. I'll, I'll first address lead green. Christine, with lead, they have a couple things going on. They want to sort of like give you as a person some certification, and they want to give the building some certification recognition. Lead green most likely comes from the lead green associate. Is as, a, as an early professional, new professional in the industry, you can become a lead green associate, which means you've got some basic training on the codes and lead. You can help on projects. As you get more experience, they have the lead accredited, accredited professional, which is called lead AP. So, so in, as a person, Christine, you can become lead green associate or lead accredited professional. Now let's move on to the building. Buildings, as you probably have noticed, you'll see, you know, USGBC, <coughs> they have medals or, or, or plaques as you enter buildings. And that started, starts as a lead certified building. Basic, basically, you yeah, met the basic lead requirement, lead silver, lead gold and lead platinum. I think that's where that's coming from, uh, Christine. So the people, lead green associate, lead AP, the buildings, certified silver, gold, or platinum. Okay, that great. Thank yes, thank you. Um, another question we have is, um, what does it mean if my state doesn't show statewide codes? Uh, <clears throat> yes. Some states do not have a statewide code for anything. I, I think uh, sometimes they call them free, freehold states or something. But I would, I would then say take a look at the local municipality. Um, in those states that have no code, most of the cities or counties or local municipalities have a version that they are following. And it, 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 if they can't find that information, you know, email me, and then I'll get the information. I'll, I'll, I'll just go to energycodes.gov website. It kind of does indicate that. If there's still some confusion about what's in my local state or uh, uh, municipality, you can email, uh, contact Graybar, and it'll contact me, or just go right to the local building uh, permit uh, facilities where you pull a permit. They should understand and tell you what code they're using for the local city. And we find that uh, some cities, uh, even in those states, have been pretty strict to energy codes you have to follow. Another great question. Great, thank you. 
another one we got was, do you help with commissioning? So I don't know if that's the gray bar side or the Lutron side, but uh, do you want to take that one? Yes, yes. We At Lutron, as, as well as other manufacturers, uh, we do offer full-scale commissioning services. You can actually, and sometimes uh, we have contractors who love to say, okay, Lutron, take care of this for me. And then, you know, we we provide that, that project quote through our distributor, um, and we come out and do all of all of it. Um, in California, we could actually do the, the first commissioning, and we have separate people come in and do the acceptance testing. But yes, we do provide that service. Uh, there are also some third-party commission agents that, that you can hire. Uh, what, what I find is that uh, on some of the massive projects, they want the manufacturer of Lutron to do it. Smaller projects, turnkey, quick moving, they, they teach them their, their, their style of how to do it. And then um, <clears throat> some of the simpler systems, I'm telling you, are so easy to commission these days. Use an iPad or an iPhone. More people are getting comfortable with it. Okay, thank you. Um, another question we have is, what new technologies um, are contractors using? Oh, that's, there are so many. Um, and I think it starts with the fact that, like you said, uh, like Christine said earlier, um, there's such an opportunity in controls. I see, let's that's that's first talk about what manufacturers are using. A lot of manufacturers are moving towards wireless controls. That helps because it, it helps the contractor install all these controls quicker. And also with the wireless controls, if I go back to one of the wiring diagrams there, I can have a much higher skilled uh, person familiar with high voltage put in the basic lighting fixtures and I can come in afterwards and put the wireless controls in. So that helps the contractor. A lot of what's also happening in the industry is that there's a lot of network uh, systems coming into place because to be honest with you, some of these controls now that are being stated in the code, uh, I, I would even call them somewhat advanced. We would, we used to, at Lutron, we used to call these controls that are being required by like California, they were advanced controls uh, five, ten years ago. Uh, you'll see now, Christine, a lot of people um, putting in some basic programming uh, systems in place. You also see more technology going into the fixture. So you see the controls attached to the fixture. And what contractors are doing, and I'm glad you asked it from a contractor point of view, is that they're actually using some more prefab services. They're starting to sort of sign some of these controls beforehand and label them. They're starting to think about uh, different skill sets of people to do this. And they're actually using a lot. They're, they're, they're using the, the checklist that they use for their safety uh, checkoffs. They're actually starting to create checklists for the lighting controls on the iPad they use remotely to help this go through. Um, and they, they, they're, they're definitely getting clever, these contractors, on where they use sort of like individual fixture by fixture or whether I do zoom by zoom control. So they're getting quite clever, but to summarize it, I'd say a lot of wireless, a lot of sort of different fixture technologies, a lot of uh, prefab stuff going on, uh, and then a lot of checklists inside right on their little uh, their iPads on their job site to make sure this process gets communicated. Great. Um, I think you more or less answered this question, but it's kind of a follow-up to that one. So the question is, um, what is clear is the world of lighting controls is on the verge of change. What isn't clear is what protocols and technologies will win. What do you think? That's a good question, and I know we we all keep uh, we all keep up to date following the trends. There's a lot of them. I, <clears throat> too many to count. There's new wireless technologies, new wireless protocols, new wired protocols. In the end, I really think it still comes down to that process. Choose a reputable manufacturer. Choose somebody you trust. But most importantly, as a contractor, make sense of what's going on to the end user. Follow the process. Communicate to the end user how it works. I think we get lost in technology sometimes. Communicate how it works for the end user. If the contract is comfortable communicating to the end user how this thing's supposed to work, they will trust the contractor to use the technology of their choice. But there's so much. It's exciting. Right? There's so much technology out there. There's new sensing technology, new wireless technology, new wireless protocols, new players entering the market. And, and, and to keep that chaos in check, I, I've seen the best contractors partnering with their local teams, local distributors for expertise, following the process, 
some cases even limiting the choices to make sure the end user can come to them as an expert. I can't tell you who will win. To me, it's the person who can clearly communicate to the end user what it does. Okay, thank you. So it looks like we have two final questions. Um, the first is, when power is interrupted, do controls reset to the off state? Is this behavior programmable? Um, it, it varies a lot, but best practices is that when power gets interrupted and when the lighting, when it comes back up, uh, they come back to the state they were in. That, but in some cases, people wanted to come back to a noon state. You can override that in some cases. But the most, most is to come back in the state they were in or the state that, uh, that they would be in that time of day. But the controls are advanced enough that they, they make sure the user isn't confused. Some of the old controls, and I'm saying old, way back in the day, would default to on or default to off, and that was not acceptable for most users. Okay, um, thank you. There's a, there's, a, there's a question that popped up about Title 24 Law in Ohio and Kentucky. I'll take that one. Title 24 is just California only. Ohio and Kentucky will, will, will be on, they'll either use ASHRAE or IACC, I can look it up, but definitely not Title 24. Title 24 is just for California. Great, thank you. Um, well, we're about out of time at this point. If we didn't get to your question, a Graybar representative will follow up with you after the presentation. As a reminder, this presentation will be archived on the graybar.com website, so that will include the slides and the webinar recording. Again, thank you for your time today, and we hope you'll join us again for an upcoming G2 talk.